On today's Impactful Latinos, we have Jean Hernandez. Welcome, Jean. Well, thank you, Jackie. I appreciate that. Now, for those who don't know you, can you explain a little to the audience who are watching who you are? If you'll explain to me how you picked me as an impactful Latino, that's the first I've heard of that, is how does that work? Oh, wow. <laughs> well, I looked at your um, bio, and I thought it was great. Okay. Um, especially as a chief of police. I, I think that is in today's day and age, the police is being, um, it's a focal point in society. And I feel that we need to, all, it's, it's not an easy job for no, anyone. No, Jackie, it's not. And the reason I asked you that, <coughs> because I've always made a, a career and a personal goal. I don't separate uh, ethnicities or nationalities, you know, how does it feel to be a, you know, Hispanic police chief, or in my case, a Mexican police chief? I don't know. I don't, I don't think that way. How does it feel to be a qualified police chief? What does it take to become a police chief? I can tell you about that. Tell and us I, about it. And, and I will also tell you about, you know, is it a tough job? Of course it's a tough job. It's the only job I know people pay you to do and hate you for doing it. it it's a rough job because right now our society is very violent. There, a lot of angry people. People are angry. And you try to pin it down. What are you angry with? I don't know. I'm just angry. Prices, taxes, my life, my marriage. There's a lot of anger. And many times the media plays on that anger. And we just saw last year a, a year of horrible violence in our, in our communities, our cities. And that makes it very hard when people turn to us, protect us from that, or you're the problem. Everything would be wonderful. We didn't have police. Really? Is that how that works? Well, we've come to see that, no, that's not the case. People need protection. Now, can we do better at our job? Absolutely. Do we need to do better? Absolutely. But as I told you, we draw our officers from the human race, shock, and from your community. Our police officers are your mother, fathers, brothers, and sisters, aunts, and uncles. That's who we hire. We're not hiring Martians. So when people say them, and they love to put labels, the police, well, which police? State, federal, local, community, w which police? Um, it's not an easy job uh, for anyone to, to be in that position because you have the power of enforcing certain rules in society. And for if you were in another country, they would, if it's a corrupt country, then it could go the opposite way. Uh, where, you know, they're, they, they want, you know, like, instead of enforcing in a correct way, they'll do it in a different way where they put the, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like, I know exactly what corrupted. you're saying. What, they're, what you're saying is that in other countries, police are used as to maintain the status quo. Yes. So if the status quo is corrupt, your job is to maintain that corruption, and you become corrupt. So in our country... That is not the philosophy of our policing. Our policing's philosophy is it's community-oriented. And you, you kind of have to laugh at that. What do you mean community-oriented? What other kind of policing is there but involving the community? That's like uh, medicine-oriented medicine, you know, patient-oriented medicine, or uh, academic-oriented edu uh, uh, education. I mean, it goes hand in hand. Police work is people work. So you have to love and embrace people and want to help people. So the mindset of, well, in other countries, they're, they're the oppressor, you know, because they maintain the status quo. So people will come here and think, oh, I'm going to stay away from the police because they're the oppressor. Just, yeah, we are not. We are the ones to help and support you. What is it you need? Arrest is the final tool in our multiple tool bag when everything else fails. When it all fails and we are forced to uh, remove you from the environment and make an arrest, that's not something that we uh, uh, love to do. We're good at it, but it's not something that we should be embracing. An arrest is a failure of the system. Somewhere along the line, the system didn't work, and we had to make an arrest. And I'd rather find out why did that happen? Why did that drunk man beat his wife? How did that happen? Well, he'd been drinking for some time. It was organic, or he made bad choices. or uh, There's never a good excuse, but there are excuses. And that's where we try to zero in on how can we correct that. I don't want to have my officers go out and arrest the same drunk on the same street corner every day and say, I made 10 arrests this week. The same guy, same drunk. 
Well, definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. Come on. Find out why he's there. Where's his family? What is his drinking issue? Does he need help, medical? So there's a whole host of tools we have in our tool, tool bag. What is it like for to be a police officer? For example, what made you want to be a police officer? Great question. I, uh, well, I grew up watching Dragnet and Adam-12. What, Adam-12 and Dragnet? I thought, well, that's really cool. That would be a cool job. Well, when I was a sophomore in high school, I went to a career day, and it was a LAPD officer was speaking about a career in law enforcement. And I was mesmerized. I was blown away. I go, that's what I want to do. You know, he explained how you're not eight to five in an office. You know, your office is your car outside, driving around, helping people. Now, that's what I want to do. So I geared my education. I ended up graduating from, from Burbank High School. Then I went on to college and graduated from San Jose State University and with administration of criminal justice. I got my master's in management. This is what I want to do. I wanted to be a professional police officer. And uh, because you, when you say why, it sounds so corny. You say, well, you want to help people. Well, you, you, A, I want to help people. B, I want to be uh, uh, an impactful force in my community. And C, I had been the receiving end of law enforcement. Not me personally, but my brothers. Uh, my youngest brother particularly was, he was a rebel rouser. In high school, he was always getting into trouble. And Burbank PD was knocking at the door. <laughs> here's your brother. Here's your, here's your son. You know, and, and he deserved what he got. He was, he was mouthy and always gave everybody a hard time. And yeah. I said, Rocky, you got to clean up your act, man. Come on. But I always appreciated how professional the officers were in dealing with that. You know, they didn't cuff him or smack him or like I would have. They just were very professional. And I thought it just kept reinforcing it. So it, it's funny. When you see certain things and you have a mindset, what do they call that? Uh, focused attention. Uh, I saw the good that they did. And some people had bad experiences. They would see the bad that they did. My brother Rocky didn't see the good that police did. Okay. I did. So... Um, so I said, I can, I can do this. I want to, I want to help people in, in, in trouble or hurting. And that's really what we did. We did, people focus on the arrest, but let me tell you, a lot of times. Sometimes that helps. They, well, the impact of the arrest, you, you, you arrest a, uh, a drunk driver and it's a, it's a husband who's been drinking for some time and his family, uh, his wife and his kids are at home and they're, they're, they're just beside themselves. They don't know what to do. What can we do? He's hurting. And so he's drinking the pain. He's, you know, self anesthetizing with alcohol. How do you help that? And that really has an impact on you. you. You see that are homeless. When you look in the face of people that have no hope, they just have no hope. And you think, man, you know, I learned how to talk with homeless, by the way. It's, you always ask them, what's your story? Don't ask them, well, you made a lot of dumb choices. What are you doing here? You know, it's always, what's your story? And they'll tell you. And a lot of them will take blame for it. Because generally I found when I would call and say, hey, look, we got your dad out here. Uh, we're in California, they're in Missouri. Can you come out and help us? No, he's worthless. We don't have anything to do with him. How do you cut a family member loose? And how do you not take responsibility for that? Like somehow you can just say, I'm done. I'm, I'm done with this person. So now you share that burden on the rest of society and we got to take care of your responsibility? Yes. Um, I have seen police officers do incredible things. And so when I put myself in their shoes, I just think of them, okay, they say bye to their family, but they don't know they can come back. You know, it's funny you say they say goodbye to their family. What other job do you know that when you say goodbye to your family, you put on your tools of the business? Calculator, ruler, pen, no. Police work, you put on a gun, you put on handcuffs, you put on a baton, and you leave. That's a significant difference. But it's a career that we choose. No one forces us to be a police officer. My biggest fear is when we're going to have young people who no longer want to be police officers. Ooh, like you. I don't want to do that job. It's too dangerous. Somebody's got to do it. We need help. It's like the military. Somebody's got to be in the military. Well, I don't want to go to Afghanistan or Pakistan and get blown up. Thank God we have people that will do that, that are willing to protect us. They're heroes, in my opinion. Right. And I don't think that's going to happen because the United States, we're strong people. I mean, right now, yes, there, there's... Uh, you could say that maybe society is a little bit soft and things like that, but at its core, we have gone through such a big history, and throughout it, we have always come through. And we're a very tough society. We're really hardworking. We're the hardest working country in the world. You're absolutely right. 
and I used to think that too, but I've seen some things done and philosophies and mindsets that I would have never would have believed would happen in our country. And it, it scares me, especially with young people who they're like the Pied Piper and, and the, the rats out of the town following them. They don't think, where are you going with this? It's almost like you'll say things just to get an effect, just to, you know how when we were young, we would say something just to shake up our parents. I grew up in the 60s. Trust me, trust me that was a bad time. And you almost did things just to get a, you know, a rise out of your parents. Oh, I don't ever want to work. I think I'll just live off the dole. Well, I'd get cuffed on the side of the head and said, get to work. You know, you know, your boarding house is done. You got, you got to work. Well, when people start having that kind of mindset, young people, and then they start getting elected and making laws to do that, we don't want to kill anyone. So let's not pay, let's not put anyone in jail. Okay, these are bad people. I've dealt with genuinely bad people. Are they bad by nature? No, they've had experiences or whatever. They've come to this point in their life where they are dangerous and they're dangerous to you and your family and to me and my family. And so action has to be taken. Now, we're not judge and jury. We only bring them in front of the judge, in front of the jury, and let them decide. Now, whatever they decide, that's up to them. I was never an avenging angel. If you broke the law, I made the arrest, and I turned it over to the system, and the system took care of it. And either they let you go or whatever, they could put you in jail, whatever they're going to do. That wasn't my role. And I think that's what kept me sane during my career, 35 years in police work, was that I'm not an avenging angel. I'll do my job. I want to protect people. More importantly, I want to educate people. I spent a lot of time educating people. You know, what can we do? How can we help? Well, one, be a good parent. We don't teach parenting class. Well, we start to now, but there was no parenting classes. And, and parents, mothers and fathers, genuinely felt helpless with their kids. Their kids would do things or they would communicate with each other, get on the computer. Parents didn't know what they were doing. Oh, everybody does this, Mom. Everybody does this, Dad. Don't worry about it. Well, parents almost got disenfranchised. Instead of being parents again and saying, you're not their best friend. You're their parent. You tell them what you want done and how you want it done. And when they get old enough to go on their own, then they can do what they want. But right now, they're under your roof, your rules. And I, I had a family one time, a single parent, and she wanted to be her kid's best friend. So she would literally drive them out to go graffitiing at 1 and 2 in the morning on the sides of freeways. And we finally caught them. And, and her, I go, what were you thinking? Oh, it's just harmless kids out there, you know, spray painting other people's property, the property that we as taxpayers have to pay for. Do you know that costs us millions of dollars? Cost costs you millions of dollars because of the taxes you have to pay? That's not good parenting. And what if they get hurt out there? It's very dangerous. Boom, the light bulb goes on. But it's that kind of education that, I spent a lot of time talking to people, so just think about your actions. There are consequences for your actions. As much as our country and our current leadership tries to pretend there's, there's no consequences for actions, there is consequence for action. And the more we put that myth on young people, the more they grow up with, oh, why are you doing this to me? You can't do that to me. Yes, we can. There's consequences for your actions. Really? I've never been held accountable before. Well, I'm sorry to say you are now. Yes, very much true. And I'm glad that you brought that topic because um, it is, uh, in today's society, some people believe that maybe they could just run on their own without any restraint. And I think that's why having the police is so important in any society, in any country, and having it uphold justice. Uphold justice, right? Not like you said, you're not judge and jury. You know, and it's really incumbent upon police departments to be working with their communities and their civic leaders. And we need good elected officials. You, you did mention I'm also an elected official. I'm the mayor pro tem for my city, and I was a former mayor twice. And, and I love that job because I'm working with my community, getting things done. But I have a responsibility, too, to look and, and use my experience and education and say, okay, where are we headed to? What's going on? Which is why we really get involved with other uh, leaders and other cities throughout the uh, out the county and the state and the country. Okay, what is it we need to be doing? What are the trends out there? Where are we going? And it's my job to educate my community. We're, we're heading for a very, very serious drought. We're in a drought in California. California's a dry state. Yeah. Well, we've had a century, an unusual century of, of excess water, and we try to turn California to a lush jungle environment. We're not. And now water has become more and more scarce. And so now we need to do a better job of reclaiming, recycling, which 
by the way, Orange County does a very good job of that. We've invested a whole lot of money into our infrastructure, and we do a good job of that. But it's coming, and it's hard to get people educated of the fact that, well, what do you mean? I turn on my tap, water comes out. Well, you know, there's some cities in this state, you turn on the water and it doesn't come out, or what comes out is brown dirt-looking water. They can't even drink it because it's so unsafe. Mm -hmm. So we need to work together throughout the state. Not, I don't want to develop a state that's just between the haves and the have-nots, where the haves have water and clean water and the have-nots don't. No. You know, we're all citizens in, in this together. This is not a political issue. I'm not talking, you know, red or, or blue. I'm talking we're all citizens of California and citizens of this country. We need to warm up to that concept and think that way. Yes, I think it's very right what you're saying. And I, another thing is coming together as a community and really paying attention to who our officials are, uh, what policies are taking place in every level. And w we can't just be just going to work, coming home, and also maybe go to a sports event or a concert. I mean, with the pandemic, it kind of made us kind of just stay home and really focus, right? It, it did. And the other problem we have with that concept of um, is that we don't have a willing partner in the news media. The m news media, they're, they're not an impartial trier of fact. I hate to sh say this to you. They are not an impartial trier of fact. They're a business. And what is their business? News. Their job is to sell news. That's how they make their money. Well, everything's going along happy and smooth. That's not going to sell any papers. So they need to have drama and tension all the time. And so we get a steady diet of, to the point where I have a lot of friends, they don't even watch the news anymore. They go, it's too depressing. It's too, and I don't see that in my immediate community. I'm not going to watch that. That's a problem because they can really influence a lot of, of, a lot of young people, a lot of all people, but particularly young people, and what they watch. And they would think that the United States is going to hell in a handbasket. Well, that's not true. <laughs> you know, it's not true. We are a great nation. Uh, and some people take offense. Oh, we're not a great nation. Name another nation that tries to be as good, at least has the lofty principles that we ascribe to. What other country? We're not perfect. I didn't say that. By no stretch are we perfect. But give me another form of government that's better than ours. There is none. There is none. No, there is and, and there's a lot of ugliness going on around the world. And we're kind of like, well, let's just close our eyes to it. No, that's not. We're Americans. We're people of action. People would say to me, well, Gene, do you get upset when somebody burns the American flag? I get upset, but I recognize their right to do that. And I will support them and defend them. And I will keep people back from hurting them for that. I think they're an idiot, but I will protect them from doing that, you know, for, for doing that. Because we have, you can't have a fake freedom. You either have the freedom or you don't. Which is why I get upset with people saying, well, we have freedom of speech. Well, in some circles, you have freedom of speech as long as they, you agree with them. If you don't agree with them, then it's no longer freedom. Then it's, and I see that happening with our social media platforms, you know, where, you know, Facebook, Twitter, all these other uh, mediums that if, if you disagree with them, they self-censor. Man, you can't do that. You can't self-censor. Give me all the facts. I'll decide. Don't don't think for me. Exactly. And I have a problem with that with teachers who do that. That, you know, they teach their students. Okay, you need to think this way. Boom, boom, boom. No, that is not your job. That's my job as a parent to teach my kids their value system. Your job is to teach them. Okay, how do we do this? You know, what do I research? How does that look like? What does it work like? Throw out an example and let me go research it. And then validate who you're getting that research from, who did the research. See, a lot of people don't do that. They go on factoid, what I call factoids. What is that? A factoid is a, 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 a statement that you pass off as fact that can't be proven. Well, police departments are racist. That's a factoid. Okay, let's go factually. Well, what do you base that on? Oh, everybody knows. What do you mean everybody knows? Is there a fact that you can show me that that uh, police departments are, are more racist than the communities they're in. That they have more. Well, look at all the people that are shot and killed. Oh, let's take a look at that. Do you know how many people are shot and killed? And you know how many people of color are shot and killed? Do you know more whites are killed by police than minorities? Did you know that? Well, it stands to reason there's more whites than there are minorities, so you're gonna, the number's going to be bigger. Well, how is it that we have yes, more, more people of color in, in jail? Well, let's talk about that. Okay, where's the economic disparity? It's usually with people of color and minorities. They make less money, less job. We can talk about why that is, but for the sake of argument, that it, let's, let's accept that, that that's reality. So they're going to commit more crimes of violence, some are, 
to get money from their their communities. And by the way, people of uh, minorities, let's say in this case, who commit crimes in their own community, the victims are their fellow minority. So to say, well, they came in and they, they shot this person. Well, what was the person doing? Oh, nothing. I always get that. Nothing. Okay, what does nothing look like? Do you know the facts? And we go through this. The police stopped him for no reason. Do you know it was no reason? Do you know? Did you see why they stopped him? And then, well, then, then he ran and they shot him. Well, why did he run? Well, he was afraid of them. Well, do you know that when he ran, he turned and they saw a gun on him and, and he went for it? No, I don't believe that. Well, okay, I, to have an open dialogue, you have to have an open mind. And if you're convinced that we're murderous thugs, I will never change that, that, that opinion. And you will only find ways to confirm that police are murderous thugs. So it's very hard to, to have a dialogue with someone like that. I mean, I'd love to, but it, real quick, it goes off to the deep end. Well, you're only saying that because you're a racist. That ends all arguments, by the way. Yes. Well, you're a racist. Well, <laughs> and what are you basing that on? Because I disagree with you? Right. I wanted to ask, what's it like when you put on that uniform? Well, after you look in the mirror, go, hey, I'm pretty good. No, <laughs> no I, I, that was a joke. Uh-huh. We have a sense of humor. Okay. Uh, yes, when you, I, know. I will okay. tell you, when you put it on, you become an immediate target and an immediate mindset for people. Once I put that blue uniform on, and if I were to make a car, sto- car stop, you're a racist, you're a bigot, you're going to kill me, I'm afraid of you. All that comes just because I put the uniform on. They don't even know me, but I had this uniform on. I would go to the store, stop in there for whatever, sold or something and mothers would point to their little kids if you're not good you see that man over there he's going to arrest you now what mindset is that putting in that little child they're learning to fear the police as opposed to if you're ever in trouble he's the one you need to go to see they don't they don't teach them that so what is it like when you put that on you recognize immediately that you're gonna you're gonna evoke emotions out of people just because you're in that uniform that it's it's the weirdest sensation that if once I had that uniform on or had it on, I immediately evoked emotion, either bad or good, from people. Good citizens, they loved it. Bad citizens were fearful. And I always to hear, well, the police are always harassing me. They're pulling over because because I'm black. Okay, and I, I would get all the complaints as a police chief. They would come to me. I said, really? Okay, you know that's illegal, the racially profile. And if I had an officer doing that, I would fire him. So you're saying he pulled you over just because you're black? Yes. And how do you know that? Well, you know, uh, I said, you do know that it was 2 in the morning, and he can't even see what color you are when you're driving when you went through that red light. He just saw the red light violation. No, he did it because I was black. I've been in the car. I can't tell what color you are when I pull you over at night. I can't. And during the day, okay, uh, why would I waste my time looking at you, harassing you, when there are real crooks out there committing crime? I don't have the time or the luxury to do that, number one. And number two... That kind of mindset of an officer won't last long. They'll get themselves into trouble sooner or later, and they will get fired. No question about it. I know because I've done it. I've fired them. Now that you have all this experience and um, being a poli- uh, in the police department, what can you say to the young um, crowd that might be watching? What would you say to them to encourage them to maybe go to the police force? Um, or even military, or something to serve the country. You choose police work, but police work chooses you too. So it's, it's a mindset that's not for everyone. I, I get that. So I'm not sure I would tell them that. I would say follow their heart, do their homework, do their research. What is it in life? They need to discover what they want to do first with their lives. What do they want to be? What do they want to do? Do they want to be pay lip service to something, or do they really want to do work. They really want to make an impact on their community. And there's a lot of ways to do that. I believe in in community service and personal involvement in the community. I am a Rotarian. I was in the YMCA. You know, I serve senior citizens. I've built homes in Mexico. I've done wheelchairs in Mexico. Tell me about that. So, you know, it's funny. People say, well, we need to help these people when they get here. Better yet, why don't you put your, your work where your mouth is and go there and help them out in their home countries. And so I've had an opportunity. I became a Rotarian when I was a young sergeant. I was asked to speak at a Rotary Club. And heretofore, I thought Rotary was, that. that's just rich white guys. You know, I can't afford that group. And then I spoke on, I was a SWAT team sergeant at the time, and I spoke about the SWAT team. And next day, 
Gene, would you consider joining Rotary? I go, Rotary? I saw the mayor in there. I saw, you know, my captain. Uh, I'm not sure I'm at that level. We want you. So I became a Rotarian. Best thing I ever did. Best thing. Rotary is all about helping people. It was all about Rotary's, Rotary's motto is service above self. Service above self. And I loved it. I said, okay. So we started doing community projects. We would help build people's, you know, uh, paint their houses. If they were too elderly, they couldn't do it. All kinds of local work. And then I found the international side of it. I had an opportunity to go down through what they call Project Corazon. We would go, we, this was Rotarians, would team up with a group that was building homes in Mexico for those that needed in very impoverished areas. I mean, these are people that were living in cardboard shacks or a cardboard box. So, but they were hardworking and they, they, it wasn't a lack of laziness. They wanted to get things done. So we would partner up with Corazon. We'd go down there and they had a list of people that had qualified to have a home built. They had sweat equity. They were trying hard to improve themselves. And we would go down and we would build a home. We would leave at 6 30 in the morning, come back at 5 30 at night, and we have built a home in Mexico for one of these families. And that was one of the most rewarding things I had ever done. And before that, actually, I, I went down with Rotor where we did wheelchair distribution to the Mobile Challenge. So we went to uh, Puerto Vallarta. And I thought, oh, Puerto Vallarta, that's going to be a nice, nice little vacation for me. That's yeah. what I was thinking. <laughs> yes. And then I got down there. That was one of the first international projects I had ever done. And that's what opened my eyes to say, wow, I saw people from all over Mexico, all over Mexico, crawl, drag, drive, ride about, well, however they could get there, family, relatives, to receive these wheelchairs. I never realized how important a wheelchair was to somebody. When you're dragging what we call a crawler, dragging yourself around on a cardboard box, you have to always look up at people. And they look down at you. Well, right away, there's that disparity that you're less than them. You're the dust on their shoes. So once you put them in a wheelchair, now they can see eye to eye with you and they feel like they're worth something. They can go to a table and do work. You gave them self-respect. You gave them hope back. And that, I got on the plane flying back with my fellow Rotarians. We go, <clears throat> that was an amazing experience. That's when I went from joining a Rotary Club to becoming a Rotarian. And I said, what's next? So we, we collaborated collaborated together on the plane and next year we said hey, we're going to build water wells in Africa. So we went to Zambia, Africa and we built five water wells in very impoverished country. I mean a, a country that looked exactly like what you expect to see on National Geographics. Really? You know the thatched roofs, mud sides and we went to these these villages and we built water wells. We, we dug them and built them and fresh water. The water was there they just didn't have any access to get to it. And I'll never forget that one little boy, young little African lad, he, he ran from the crowd because we were about ready to open the first well and the water come out and the water started to come out. And he ran and he came back holding a big Wesson oil can. And I asked this guy, I said, hey, wh what's he doing with the Wesson oil can? He goes, well, he's afraid the water's going to go away, so he wants to hurry up and get what he can. And, oh, I thought, how little it was for me to do this, nothing and how impactful it was on in that village. Because now that village with water that they could count on fresh, reliable, clean water, they could now spend more time going to the market and selling things or creating and making things and selling them. Before the wells, these people had to hike, hike four to five miles to the, the river, in this case the Zambezi, to get water, brackish water. And when I say walk, hike through the bush, I don't mean taking a sidewalk stroll. They're going through where wild animals exist, you know, hippos, lions, oh things goodness. that can hurt you. I cannot even imagine that. And they, they carry these full, like a sparkless water bottle. Like the example I use to people, try taking a wa sparkless water bottle, put it on your head, and try to walk five feet, let alone five miles back. And it, uh, hats off to people that are so hardworking. Because you're poor doesn't mean you're weak or that you, 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 you feel sorry for yourself. In fact, in most uh, impoverished countries, and I've seen them. I also did polio drops in India. Very impoverished communities, or the Muslim community was very, very poor. They don't feel sorry for themselves. They work hard to improve their situation. Whether it's, you know, if they make little things to sell them, and I make mean little things, kids would play with coat hangers, like a long coat hanger with a handle, and little the coat hanger ends, and they'd put little pop bottle caps on there, and they'd roll it around like a little toy. I mean, that's creative. Because there, if you don't become creative, if you don't find a way to eat, 
you die. It's that simple. You die. People on the side of the road just keel over and die. People walk around them. You don't see that in this country. So don't ever tell me how bad off we have it here. We, you don't know poverty in this country. Well, you know what our crime is in this country? We have the, the sin of excess. The sin of excess. We have so much that it's made us insensitive to those that don't have. That's a problem. That is a problem. Oprah Winfrey on her show one time, she did a, a, a little article about, uh, she was questioned, why don't you spend all this money in America? Why do you always come out here to Africa? Why don't you do it to the Appalachian Mountains? She goes, you know why? I went to a school one time and asked the kids in America, okay, what is it you need? What do you really need? You know what I got? I want the latest iPhone. I want the latest iPad. I want the you know, latest electronic device. She went to a school in South Africa, uh, I want to see Zimbabwe, and ask the kids, you know, what is it you want? And the, the kids said, I want an education. And then the second little girl said, we want toilet paper in our school rooms. Toilet paper in your school rooms. Some girls couldn't even go to school because if there was no sanitary situation there, they, they couldn't go, so they'd miss school. And I thought, wow, how simple is that? So as we as Rotarians, I went over that we built, we built uh, uh, toilet, toilets and, and mo most of the world does not have flush toilets, by the way. You know that. 90% does not. Yeah. So we went there and we actually worked on building clean latrines, sanitary latrines, toilets, and showers. I mean, it was nothing for us. It, it took, you know, a week or two out of my, out of my life. I helped raise the money to do it, and we impacted a whole village. How much we have the capability to do, and we don't do it. We, we, we complain. We whine about it. I hear these people on TV, and I just want to slap them. Well, get out there and then do something about it. Oh, these poor people, they're coming across the border. They have nothing. Well, then why don't you go across the border and help them out instead of sit here and whine and do nothing on your couch? Don't get me going. <laughs> yes, I. you've brought a lot of different um options for people and I think that's great well you asked me and I'm sorry I didn't really answer what do you tell young people out there yes. get off the couch put the game boy away uh, get out there and get your hands dirty get involved in your community there's so much work that needs to be done and volunteers are the cream of the crop we need more volunteers what can you do get out there and do it don't worry about the latest trends and clothes and you don't have it don't worry about that worry about helping your fellow man it'll reward you the rest of your life very true very true. Well, thank you so much for coming in today. Thank you for having me. And thank you for the show. I really think it's awesome. I really do. And thank you for coming. My pleasure. <laughs>